Simon did his PhD with David Bellwood at JCU and at the Center of Excellence. He finished just before I started, so that would be probably what, late 2015 or something? Mid-2015. Mid-2015. So his PhD topic was uh, resource partitioning in herbivorous reef fishes. And after he finished his PhD, he started focusing on cryptobentic reef fishes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, these are gobies, blannies, and things like that. And then he first realized that we didn't really know what or who cryptobentic reef fishes were. So he went on to define them. And after that, he has been exploring their ecosystem function and their impact on broader reef processes. So Simon is also renowned for, for his engagement in outreach and communication, largely via Twitter. And he's also legendary for his typing and coffee drinking skills, apparently. So Simon's just about to start a new permanent professorial position at the University of Texas. And uh, without anything else, I would leave it to him. Thanks for giving us the talk, Simon. Thank you, Renato. That, that, that was basically the talk, actually. I don't think I need to, <laughs> to give my presentation anymore. But um, yeah, thank you all for tuning in and for having me. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully everybody can see that. Renato, can you give me a quick thumbs up if the screen sharing works? Excellent. Okay, so I will talk today about fishes, functions and the future of coral reefs. However, before I get too far into the coral reef side of things, I'm first going to talk about the riveting topic of personal finance. So most of us have our money in one of two different accounts, either a checking account or a savings account. The checking account is generally what we uh, use on our day-to-day -day basis or we spend at the grocery store and where our paychecks come in and everything. And after a while, money from that checking account ideally goes into the savings account, slowly accumulates, and eventually buys us a nice piece of real estate. However, if you are a millennial like me, then your savings account probably isn't particularly large because you're spending way too much money on avocado toast. Now, I'm not here to tell you about my own personal finance struggle and my fondness for pear-shaped, wrinkly, overpriced fruit. What I do want to make clear, though, is that whatever happens in our checking account is definitely going to affect our savings. So it would be very wise to monitor that checking account. But we're all biologists and as ecologists uh, and as biologists or ecologists, we're often tasked with assessing the state of an ecosystem, which sounds fairly straightforward in theory. And to do so, we often monitor things like forest cover, the number of sharks, the number of elephants or penguin colonies. And the general wisdom is that the more we have, the better it is. More sharks, that's better. But being biologists, we also know that sharks just don't just drop from the sky. Their growth is fueled by animals farther down the food chain. And as such, they are actually created. And that makes them more or less the savings account of nature. So trees, sharks, penguins, and elephants are really all just the outcome of processes that underpin this savings account. And that is the checking account. These are processes like primary production, predation, herbivory, or nutrient cycling that slowly accumulate over time to create these, these large animals, big pools of biomass that we usually end up monitoring. And the key is that we, are, we hardly ever monitor this checking account. And there are some really good reasons for that. The first reason is that it's a lot easier to quantify the spread of a forest than it is to watch a plant grow and quantify that. The second reason is that it's also much easier to sell people on the idea that penguins are really important to monitor than it is to study um, the, uh, the, the process of penguin defecation. Nevertheless, I want to make a plea today that it is really important to understand this checking account. So how do we even do that? How do we figure out what goes into nature's piggy bank? Now to do that, we really have to dig into different levels of organization. 
And I'm going to illustrate that using an example from my PhD work actually at JCU. In a sense, we want to scale up from species to communities to ultimately the processes. What I mean by that is that if we're, for example, talking about herbivory, we first want to know what species actually do. What are their functional niches? In this example, what does an herbivorous fish species feed on? Then we want to know how does that affect which species is where? In a given ecosystem, we always want to know what is the community that underpins a process. And this process needs to be quantified by a rate of fluxes over time. This can be the rate of bites, the rate of algal consumption, or, or any other quantity that, we're, that, we're, that we can take as a rate over time. So let's talk about coral reefs. This is a room full of people that um, know quite well that coral reefs are a highly diverse, highly productive, and very valuable ecosystem. Um, and nobody in this room will need convincing that coral reefs are also in big trouble. And that has been the case for quite a while. And as such, this idea of quantifying coral reef ecosystem functioning has really come to the fore of any kind of um, conservation approach to coral, reef, coral reefs. As a consequence of, of this functioning idea, um, the, the uh, quantification of coral reef biodiversity and ecosystem function has really skyrocketed in the past few years. And over the past two decades, for example, the number of publications that have these two keywords, biodiversity and functioning on coral reefs, um, have really taken off. But if we look at what these studies have actually done, we can see that, yes, a lot of them look at species, communities, and different processes. But actually, there are very, very few that operate at that intersection, that take a holistic view on the role of biodiversity for ecosystem functioning on coral reefs. As a matter of fact, there is none that integrates across all three, um, three different areas. And when we then sit back and really ask the question, what is a functional coral reef? I would argue we don't really know. There is no good quantitative metric that would tell us whether a coral reef functions or doesn't. So what we did is we recently kind of created a, a framework to quantify coral reef functioning as a means of four pairs of ecological processes of consumption and production that we can use as a benchmark. By quantifying these processes, we can take the pulse of coral reef functioning. And for this talk today, I will actually focus on this loop right here, predation and secondary production. And I will focus largely on coral reef fishes. Coral reef fishes are very, very popular. They're very colorful. They are very large. And the bad news is that I will actually not be focusing on any of these fish. I will be focusing on all the fish you can see in this photograph and in this photograph. And right here, except for the one you can kind of see lurking in the background there. Now you're going to say, wow, we're not even 10 minutes into the talk and Simon has lost it already. I promise you I haven't. Uh, there are actually tons of fish in these photographs. You simply can't see them. And the reason you can't see them is because they're about that big. These are what we call cryptobenthic reef fishes. Now, cryptobenthic reef fishes come in all shapes and colors, but really only in three size classes, which is small, smaller, and extra small. And the, um, and the cryptobenthic fishes will be the, the backbone of this talk, which has the following sections. I will first introduce the cryptobenthic. I will then talk about um, species-specific uh, functional niches of cryptobenthic fishes, their assembly into communities, um, their contribution to ecological processes on coral reefs, and ultimately what that means for the future. So let's start. What are cryptobenthic reef fishes? Well, the first mention of these beasts actually came in 1979, and apparently they are small-bodied fish that exploit restricted habitat that's where food and shelter are obtained in or in relation to conditions or substrate complexity and or restricted living space with a physical barrier likely to be interposed between the small fish and sympatric predators. 
And you're like, of course they are. Um, there's, re <laughs> there's really only two things that are important to keep in mind here, which is small bodied fish and restricted habitats, which means they're small fish that like to hide. In 2003, Dip uh, 2003 Dipchinsky and Bell um, honed in on that size component and said, well, they need to be 50 millimeters or smaller to be cryptomantic fishes, which adequately describes some species of clownfish. And in 2012, Kovacic et al. said, well, their microhabitat association has to be within the reef, which adequately describes a moray eel. If you fail to see the, um, uh, the similarities between a moray eel and a clownfish, uh, you're not alone. I would certainly agree that they're not the same. And so what we wanted to do is actually find a more quantitative definition of what a cryptobenthic reef fish family even is. And to do so, we um, looked at the size distributions of species in 58 families of reef associated fishes. And then we just imposed a pretty um, arbitrary threshold where we said, if there are more than 10% species that are smaller than this 50 millimeter threshold in a given family, these are cryptobenthic fishes. And lo and behold, with that definition, we, we actually come up, uh, come up to 17 families of cryptobenthics. Now you might say, that's fantastic, Simon, but that's really quite arbitrary. But the beauty is that even if we impose a buffer around that 10% threshold, there's actually not that many families that would change designation. So what we can see is that many, many families don't have any cryptos at all. So they're just purely focused on the large size. And others like the, the tribe Terrigidae up here actually have almost 90% of species that are smaller than 50 millimeters. These are tiny. This is the size spectrum usually reserved for juveniles. So these are really the Peter Pans of the coral reef fish world. They're the ones that don't want to grow up. So how many cryptobenthic reef fish species are there? Well, that's a really good question and one that isn't actually that easily answered. So for large reef fishes, we can look at the description rates over time. So this is 1750, the dark days, and this is 2050. And we can see that over time, um, large reef fishes have been described at fairly steady rates. For cryptobenthics, that is a completely different story. They actually are really, really slow to start with it, which is not surprising given their small size. And especially since the advent of scuba and molecular methods, the, um, the description rates in these species have absolutely skyrocketed. We can do some modeling with these data and actually do some predictive modeling and that will tell us that, that by 2031, there will actually be more described species of cryptobenthics than of large reef fishes. You might wonder, well, I don't really care how many species there are. I want to know how many there are of these beasts on a coral reef. Well, this is a photograph of a very scungy reef in Tonga. And on this reef, well, you know, you might see four or five of these, of these tiny little fish, but in reality, there's actually 20 of them. And this is much less than a square meter. So there can be a lot of cryptobenthics on a, on a reef. How do you get any idea of how many there are? Well, we usually do that using these anesthetic stations. In a, st in a sense, what we do is we use a large bell-shaped net. We put it over the reef, followed by a tent. We then spray clove oil into that tent and then we remove the, um, remove the tent, slowly peel back the net and we use tweezers to pick up the little cryptobenthics and ultimately come away with a nice little bag of these tiny little fishes. There aren't a lot of places in the world where this technique has been employed. Um, in fact, if we look at the literature, it, there, there are spots on the map only far and few between. Some on tempered reefs, so these are the yellow dots, some in the tropics, these are the blue dots. And actually we can also see that it's focused on uh, a few locations like Lizard Island or Orpheus Island. However, if we look at these quantitative data, we can see that the number of cryptobenthics um, per square meter, their, their density, ranges anywhere from just over 10 to almost 30. So that's a lot of cryptobenthics on coral reefs across the globe. By now you might think, well, that's nice. I want to be a cryptobenthic. That's kind of cool. 
Um, but promise me it isn't because the three things that define the lives of every living being on this planet, which is get something to eat, don't get eaten and reproduce, um, are really, really difficult for cryptobenthics as a function of their size. Now I'm going to show you three scatter plots in the next few slides that are all the, um, that are all on the log log scale and that have body size average body size of families um, on the x-axis. The first one is the average mass specific metabolic rate on the y-axis and that shows that cryptobenthics by means of their body mass have a higher mass specific metabolic rate than many large three fish families. Cryptobenthics are in blue. What that means is that while they certainly require less food in absolute terms than for example a whale shark, they need to work harder for every gram body mass to keep themselves fed. And as a consequence, some cryptobenthics will actually spend up to 65% of their time feeding. So they need to work really, really hard just to keep nourished. This is the second one, and this is the average mortality rates. And we can see that these cryptobenthics compared to large reef fish families are, are dying like flies. They're just keeling over left, right, and center. And as a consequence, um, we have some species like these dwarf gobies that will actually only live for about three weeks as adults, which is quite a short time. And then finally, we have the average clutch size. And here, cryptobenthics are on the very low end, which means they have very, very few eggs compared to larger species. As a matter of fact, some species will actually only have about 34 eggs per clutch, which is among the lowest we know for coral reef fishes. So I think I've made it convincing that being a cryptobenthic is far from a picnic in the park. But their abundances, diversity, and extreme life history strategy actually makes them a lovely model group that we can work with to look into the dynamics that govern coexistence, community assembly, and functioning on coral reefs. And with that, I'm going to start talking about functional niches of cryptobenthic species. And to do so, I will take you to Morea in French Polynesia. This is a high island in the Pacific um, that has a wonderful lagoon that surrounds the, the entire island. And in this lagoon, we have lots and lots of little coral reef mummies and sandy patches in between, as you can see right here. On these sandy patches near the coral heads, we have what we call sand gobies. So these are two species, Cnathalipis and Caurensis and Fusigobius neophytis, and they're generally quite boring. As a matter of fact, Luke Tornabene, um, professor at, um, at the University of Washington, one of the world's experts on gobies, doesn't even care to identify them. He says they're all just FSGs, which according to him stands for filthy sand gobies. Gnathalipis, Istigobius, Corophopter, Fusigobius, all of them, same thing. Now, are they really the same thing? Because I kind of question that. Yes, they're both boringly colored, but are they really ecologically equivalent? To do so, we can, uh, to find out about that, we can look at their niches. Now, niches, unfortunately, are inherently multidimensional. They can be defined by differences in morphology, behavior, physiology, or habitat. In terms of, and, and overall, that creates this multidimensional construct that we can use to, to gauge a species, uh, species functional role. In terms of the habitat, I can assure you that they're no different at all. They occur right next to each other throughout the entire lagoon. If you don't believe me, you can look at this, uh, this map right here. These are just cryptobenthic stations and the green and blue, blue bubbles are the presence and, and abundance of Fusigobius and Nathalipis. And you can see that throughout the entire lagoon, they're basically coexisting. So let's look at the fish themselves. In terms of the morphology, the first thing to know is, yes, they're both boring, sandy colored. Um, yes, they kind of look a little bit different on the, on the head, but other than that, they're very, very similar. If we start looking at the internal morphology though, we see some pretty startling differences. This is the relative length of the intestinal tract of the two species. And we can see that Gnathalipis carensis has about twice as long a gut on average than Fusigobius neophytus. 
Now that would suggest that, hey, perhaps there's something different going on in terms of their food and digestion. So we can look at gut contents. Now gut contents are an ichthyologist's dream. We love to look at what, what species have eaten. For some, like this uh, Fistulari homersonii, that's really, really easy. This is a sand goby called Tenogobius spiroculus. But now imagine looking at the gut content of the Tenogobius uh, itself, and that gets a lot hard. So what we can do is we can employ a molecular approach to defining gut contents of species called gut content DNA metabarcoding. In a sense, how this works is you dissect out the gut of a species. You do a DNA extraction of the contents or the entire gut itself. You do amplicon library prep with the DNA. You do next generation sequencing. And ultimately, through a bioinformatics pipeline, you get matches of the gut contents to a database, or you get these operational taxonomic units that describe differences in the prey of, two, uh, of different species. If we look at Fusigobius and, and Gnathalipus, we can see that actually there's a big difference in terms of the diet. This is a, this is a diet network plot, and we can see the different modules or the different, different symbols. But the thing to notice here is that the blue and the green are pretty divided in terms of where they are and in terms of the symbols they have. So these are the different modules and it basically suggests that their diet is pretty fundamentally different. Now if they have different diets and a, uh, and a different digestive tract, we might be tempted to assume that there are also some behavioral differences. So what we did is we looked at exactly this. We looked at these foraging sand gobies in different configurations. This is one of my favorite videos. It's really calming to look at. I could just loop that the entire time. But essentially what we did is we set up these little, these little boxes, um, little aquaria, filled them with sand, and then we put Gnathalipus and Fusigobius in either mixed species, mixed species or monospecific uh, treatments into these, into these aquaria, these arenas, and we quantified the number of bites they took from the sand. And we can see that Gnathalipus, in fact, takes about an order of magnitude more bites than Fusigobius. And for both of these species, the bites were actually um, higher when they were in mixed species treatments, which suggests that there's actually some kind of facilitation and coexistence going on, whereas if they're in monospecific treatments, they're more likely to be competitively interacting with each other. So this suggests really, these are three pieces of evidence that suggest that energetically, these two species are fundamentally different. And we can actually test for that by using respirometry, by looking at these species' metabolic rates. Respirometry essentially has these little chambers um, that you can flush with oxygenated water, and then you seal them, and then you look at the oxygen consumption over a, a short period of time, and that gives you an estimate of a species metabolic rate. If we look at the two species, we can see that it's fundamentally different. Um, Gnathalipus at any given mass has a, higher, um, has a higher oxygen consumption at mean weights, sorry, at mean weights than, um, than Fusigobius neophytus, and that is at rest. At exertion, their maximum metabolic rate is even higher. Um, so what this suggests is that even though these two species both occur on the sand, they are fundamentally different in terms of their energetics. And that creates these unique functional niches. And that, that means that FSGs aren't FSGs at all. They're really different beasts in terms of their energy requirements, how they process it, and therefore their contributions to um, ecosystem functioning on coral reefs. And that also means that the FSGs don't get their feelings hurt as much anymore. From there, we can go to communities. Um, and to talk about communities, I will take you to the United Arab Emirates, which has lots of shiny buildings and some slightly less shiny coral reefs, but coral reefs nonetheless. Now, the, uh, the United Arab Emirates are on the Arabian Gulf. And um, the Arabian Gulf is really interesting because it has these extreme water temperatures. In fact, if we compare it to the nearby Gulf of Oman, uh, which has a very reasonable coral reef temperature profile, 
the Arabian Gulf has the highest summer maximum temperatures that we know and some of the lowest winter minimum um, temperatures. But this section down here in particular, where we, did, where we did the study, is mostly characterized by the extreme summer temperatures, which are actually kind of a, a laboratory, a natural laboratory for climate change. Now, we collected lots and lots of cryptobantics in both of these locations. And then we can first look at the sort of community structure. And we can find that in the Gulf of Oman, which is the pink, um, the species richness of cryptobantic is, cryptobantic is about twice as high. The abundance is even more dramatically different, where it's about six times more, more, spe uh, more individuals uh, per square meter than in the Arabian Gulf. The biomass, however, is not particularly different, which is probably related to the presence of some large um, fishes in the cryptobantic stations. We can then look at the community composition. And here, again, we can see that the two locations are fundamentally different. The surprising part is that the benthic communities actually aren't that different at all. And even more surprisingly, the percentage of live coral cover doesn't differ at all between the two locations. So despite no differences, no real differences in benthic communities, the fish communities, the cryptobenthic communities couldn't be more different. So the answer for why that is the case is, of course, easily derived. It's because of temperature tolerances. We could assume that the species that occur in the Arabian Gulf have a higher heat tolerance and cold tolerance than, than the species in the Gulf of Oman. And we can test for that using critical thermal maxima or critical thermal minima, which essentially is um, where you put a fish in an aquarium, you heat it up or you cool it down until it croaks. So we did that with six species. Three of them, the top three occur in both systems and the bottom three occur only in the Gulf of Oman. We can look at the cold tolerances and it doesn't seem to be a clear pattern there at all. There's a bit of variation, but nothing very striking as we, as we compare the top three and the bottom three. And the, the, blue, um, the blue curves here are the uh, populations from the Arabian Gulf. And the same is true for the heat tolerance. Again, we see actually really broad overlap between all of these species. And the crazy thing is when we actually look at the, the summer te uh, maximum temperatures and the winter temperatures, every single one of these species seems to be able to withstand these temperatures from an absolute temperature tolerance perspective. So there might be something else going on that isn't really captured by these, by these inherent temperature tolerances of the species. And again, this leads back to an energetic basis. We can look at the uh, uh, length weight relationships of the three species that occur on both sides. And what we find is when we plot the total length against the body weight on the y-axis, we find that um, for two of these species at least, um, the populations in the Gulf of Oman, the benign habitat, are fatter at any given size. And that suggests that, hey, they, they must be processing the energetics uh, differently. The other piece of evidence that comes, um, that comes in here is the food. We again did some, did some gut content DNA metabarcoding. And we found that the diet of these three species in the Arabian Gulf is fundamentally different from the Gulf of Oman. Given what we know that the species in the Gulf of Oman are fatter than in the Arabian Gulf, we might think that, hey, perhaps the, 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 high, uh, the high temperatures of the, Arabian Gulfs, which, of the Arabian Gulf, which requires more energy on a daily basis, interacts with the diet, which also might have some energetic uh, differences between the two systems, to force some species to be absent from the Arabian Gulf because they simply cannot cope with the energy demands of that system. And that has some serious consequences. If we look at the produced biomass in grams by cryptobenthic reef fish assemblages in the, um, in the Arabian Gulf versus the Gulf of Oman, we find that the, um, the, the cryptobenthic communities in the Gulf of Oman actually produce a lot more biomass, they produce more consumed biomass, and they have much higher turnover. 
So they produce, transfer, and replenish energy at much higher rates than in the Arabian Gulf. So that really tells us, hey, there are some energetic differences going on between those two systems. And that really leads to the final part of this talk, which is the ecological processes that underpin coral reef functioning. Because until now, you might have sat there and said, well, you know, Simon, I, I'm really more of a large reef fish person. I don't really care about cryptobenthics at all. Why should I bother with them? Well, to find the answer to that, we have to go even smaller. I know that's not the answer you were looking for. We have to go even smaller than adult cryptobenthics and look at their larvae. As most of you know, uh, reef fishes generally have this pelagic larval stage where a larvae goes out into the big blue and then eventually returns to a coral reef. And people have for many, many decades done these, these plankton toes um, where they look at the distribution of reef fish larvae around coral reefs. And so what we did is we did a meta-analysis of the community composition of these larval communities of coral reefs. And what we found is that when we go anywhere near a coral reef, the ichthyoplankton, the larval communities are absolutely dominated by cryptobenthics. In fact, up to, a three, up to three quarters of these larval communities are cryptobenthics. Now you might rightly caution that, well, that's just because there are so many of them. As a matter of fact, we could envision a very easy linear relationship between gamete output and larval supply, where there's just so many cryptobenthics that they produce a lot of eggs right here, and then as a consequence, a lot of larvae come back. We can actually look at empirical data about this. And for large reef fishes, that relationship between proportional share of gamete output and proportional share of larval supply is very, very weak. But there is a relationship which is good, makes sense. If we look at cryptobenthics, it's a completely different ballgame. As a matter of fact, the Bayesian beta regression coefficient is about uh, two orders of magnitude higher for cryptobenthics than for large reef fishes these cryptobenthics get a lot more bang for their buck. They don't have particularly large shares in the gamete output, but they get a ton of larvae back. What that means is that cryptobenthics have a completely different role on coral reefs than large reef fishes. And we can sort of visualize that using a, using a theoretical population model that takes these larval, um, these larval communities as a basis to model the growth and death of reef fishes. So how do we do that? We start with, the, with continuous larval supply from this pool of global coral reef fish larvae, and then we let them settle. There isn't actually much difference in the size distribution of these settler, settlers, but we still take it into account because that's what they're starting with. The real difference comes when we let these fishes grow and die. And this results in biomass production. But this biomass production actually branches off into two different sections. We have the net biomass production, and we can see that cryptobenthics aren't really anything to write home about there. Um, large reef fishes by, by and large um, dominate this, this net produced biomass category. The true, truly amazing part comes when we look at the gross biomass production. And here cryptobanthics are the absolute superstars. They have a turnover of almost 750% a year, which means up to seven generations in a single year. And this biomass that is produced from this continuous growth and replenishment of cryptobenthic larvae and, and adults um, accounts for about 60% of the consumed biomass on coral reefs. This is the coral reef fish checking account. This is the daily flux, the daily turnover of, of reef fish biomass, tasty little morsels of tiny little cryptobenthic fish that are being eaten and integrated into the reef fish community at a rate that we don't even notice them. And that is particularly clear when we look at the relative standing biomass, which is the, one of the single most commonly quantified um, metrics in coral reef fish ecology, where cryptobenthics account for absolutely nothing. They are 
in fact, the cryptocurrency of coral reefs. They live and die at such breathtaking pace that we don't even notice or document their contributions. But they have this massive contribution to reef fish energetics, to reef fish ecosystem function. Now, how do they do that? That's a really good question. And the answer we can come up with is that they really differ in terms of the dispersal strategies. Somehow, they got to get these larvae back in the system without having the attrition. So when I said that reef fishes generally go off into the big blue to, um, to disperse, that might not be true for cryptobenthics at all. Through a different dispersal strategy, which is stay home, stay close to the reef, don't go off into the big blue. They might actually uh, manage to have less attrition, more larvae, and therefore restart the cycle of, of their, their consistent um, production and consumption. So while most reef fishes really go off somewhere, the cryptobenthics might just be standing on the sidelines as larvae somewhere deep, deep close to the reefs and then return once they feel ready. Now, if you have some evolutionary biology training, the alarm bell should ring right now because that means that these cryptobenthic fishes um, would not have any long range or would not have much long range dispersal, which in turn means that their populations should become isolated very quickly. If that is the case, we should see two macroevolutionary patterns. The first one is we should see high species richness, and the second one is we should see low incidence of cryptobenthics across the tree of life. This is a fish tree of life, and the bubbles at the, at the tips are the species richness of the respective clade. And if we look at the positioning of the cryptobenthics, we can see that exactly what we would predict is actually the case. We have the gobies and the, the gobies over here and the blennies over here. Both of them are among the most species rich lineages of fish, um, of fish in the entire world. And we only have very, very few incidences of this cryptobenthic lifestyle, which means that there's um, probably rapid speciation going on in these fishes as a function of population isolation, but also probably in the past, high rates of extinction, which is what we would predict if there is not a lot of connectivity between populations. So cryptobenthic fishes clearly have a very unique standing on coral reefs. They fill a very unique functional role. They are important for the energetics of reef fishes, and they seem to have a peculiar model, that, uh, model of dispersal that might make them very prone to extinction. Which leads me to the future. Now I'm talking to a virtual room full of people that does not need convincing that coral reefs are in deep, deep trouble. This is a video of Morea in French Polynesia in 2019, um, where, an, where entire swaths of, of reefs bleach quite heavily. Um, and so from this, it is very, very clear that without large scale political and cultural change and sweeping legislation, coral reefs as we know them are going to be absolutely uh, decimated and might not look like the coral reefs we're used to at all. But I think it is important to remember that coral reefs will persist regardless. There will always be um, coastal ecosystems that are similar or, or reminiscent of today's coral reefs in the future. And frustrating as that may be, I think it's important that we take this really detailed energetic perspective on these systems to understand how they're functioning because they still will support a lot of people in this world. So taking this approach from species to communities to processes can really help us understand how energy moves through these systems and where it ends up. With regards to the role of cryptobenthics in the, on, on these future reefs, well, we really don't know a lot. And that's not putting us in a particularly good position to predict their fate or according, uh, or also um, to devise any strategies that could protect them. First, we're completely lacking any kind of baseline. This is the uh, size distribution of uh, marine and freshwater fishes in the Biotime database, the single most comprehensive time series of reef fish, reef fish assemblages 
and all fishes. And we can see that there's, inher there's an inherent size, size bias where small fishes like cryptobendix are not being monitored. The second um, issue here is that we don't have a lot of information about the actual species themselves. And we can look at what the experts know and the, the, uh, the answer is not a lot. This is the IUCN uh, vulnerability assessment and the probability of being data deficient. And we can see that as we go to the smallest size classes right here, about a third of all species lacks any kind of data that would allow us to gauge their vulnerability to any of the, um, any of the disturbances that we envision. So where does that leave us? Um, well, how many of you have immediately focused on this beautiful large grouper in this photo? I suspect the answer is a lot. So what you're trying to tell me is that even though I just waxed lyrically about the importance of cryptobantics for 45 minutes, you immediately focused on the large fish, even though there are some perfectly good gobies in the foreground of that photograph. This is how the human mind works. And this is what I call the panda paradigm. We're emotional creatures and we're inevitably much more attracted to big things like sharks and parrotfishes and yellow butterfly fishes than to scungy little gobies. And as such, most of our efforts to understand and conserve nature will always hinge on species that may or may not have much to do with the functioning of the reef. We will always place greater emphasis on the outcome of the ecological processes than the processes themselves. We'll always monitor the savings account. And as such, we're not too different from your average fool who spends way too much money on avocados at 250 a pop and at the end of the day has to stand there wondering why his savings account isn't particularly ample. And that's an issue. Or as the Senegalese conservationist Babadium put it, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. The good thing is there's actually a second part to this quote, which is that we will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we're taught. And I hope that at least some of you will walk out of this talk having a greater understanding of and appreciation for the avocado toast of coral reefs, cryptobenthic fishes. And with that, I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention.